Welcome to this webinar uh, on behalf of the Jesuits of Canada, Empowering the Next Generation, Girls' Education as a Path to Global Change. It will be presented by Jenny Cafiso, the Director of Canadian Jesuits International. Thank you for joining us. And I apologize that we were a couple of minutes late uh, due to a technical issue. There are a couple of housekeeping items to address before we get started. The session will be 90 minutes. That will include the presentation and the Q&A. Please enter any questions you have into the Q&A box. If you put them into the chat, they might be missed. Our recordings of the session will be sent to you within 72 hours. I'm going to hand it over to Jose Sanchez, the Director of Communications, to talk about translation and technical issues. Thank you, Pat. Welcome, Jenny. Uh, don't, uh, uh, right now, I will give you a few instructions so that those who prefer French can choose a language um, that they feel most comfortable. Yen, donc pour choisir la langue de votre préférence, si vous êtes sur, une, sur, un, sur un ordinateur, dans les commandes de votre réunion webinaire, cliquez sur le bouton interprétation et après cliquez sur la langue que vous souhaitez entendre. Si vous êtes sur un appareil mobile, dans les contrôles de votre réunion ou webinaire, appuyez sur le bouton avec les trois petits points au plus et après appuyez sur interprétation de la langue. Finalement, appuyez sur la langue que vous souhaitez entendre. C'est important aussi de se souvenir que l'interprétation linguistique n'est pas disponible lorsque vous accédez à Zoom sur un navigateur web. Thank you, Pat. Over to you. We will begin, as usual, with our land acknowledgement. Let us begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet on a virtual platform, let us take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which many of us call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and cultures. In Canada, from coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. And we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and commit each in our own way to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So thank you for joining us today. I'm pleased to see so many educators with us from GTA School Boards. It's my pleasure to introduce Jenny Cafiso. Jenny is the Director of Canadian Jesuits International, CJI, which is a small international development NGO that builds li links of solidarity and partnership between the North and the South through project funding and education and advocacy in Canada. Jenny is the assistant to the Jesuit Provincial of Canada for the International Apostolate. For eight years, she was the International Programs Coordinator at the International Office of the Jesuit Refugee Service in Rome. And she worked for 11 years as the Coordinator of Educational Animation for Development and Peace, an international development organization in Toronto. Jenny spent two years in Peru as a, Q, a CUSO cooperant with the leadership formation team of Teria, which is a popular education center working in the slums of Lima. Jenny holds an MA in political science from York University, where she specialized in the role of Canadian international development NGOs in the process of social transformation. She is a postgraduate international diploma in humanitarian assistance from Fordham University, the University of Geneva, 
and the Center for International Health and Cooperation. She currently serves on the boards of the Xavier Network, Albuan, Anenta Culturas in Spain, and Magis Americas. So um, Jenny's very well qualified. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you, Jenny, and thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, and thanks to everyone who is here tonight or this morning. I'm not sure where everyone is. But um, yeah, first, I want to thank you. Uh, thank Pat and Jose Sanchez and the province of the Jesuits of Canada and all those involved in organizing this event. Um, thanks to all of you who have uh, come and joined us. And also, I want to thank all the people that I have the privilege to work with, both in Canada and internationally, including uh, the CGI team, that our supporters, and especially the people in Africa, Asia, and Latin America who inspire and challenge me every day to always seek the greater good and to build a better world. And a special word of thanks to our translators, Michelle and Albert, and um, I hope to uh, always speak full sentences to make it easier for you. And I also want to express my apologies to all the French speaking uh, participants uh, for not speaking French tonight, but you're in good hands with our translators. So uh, thank you, Jose, for starting the, uh, I have a few slides. So I just wanna start by saying that CJI is the global solidarity uh, organization of uh, the Jesuits of Canada. We work with Jesuit partners internationally supporting initiatives that address uh, the root causes of poverty and that have the potential for lasting change in the lives of individuals and communities so that people can develop to their full physical, emotional and spiritual uh, potential. We also do awareness uh, raising and advocacy in Canada. And so for example, next fall, we will be doing a campaign on education as a human right. And, uh, and, and, and so this is a little bit part of that already beginning. The, the, we focus on agriculture, defense of human rights, socioeconomic productive activities, uh, strengthening people's organizations, building networks, and of course, education. And so it's this last one that we are going to speak about uh, tonight. So uh, my presentation today has five parts. And the sources of a lot of the information that I will be sharing today comes from um, UNESCO, the UN, UNICEF, uh, UN Women, Jesuit Refugee Service, and a number of other Jesuit sources, among others. So I will not uh, cite specifically everyone, but uh, these are where some of the statistics and information come from. So first of all, the first part is why do we do what we do at CGI? And so there are, I want to mention three things. One is uh, gospel values. Our work draws on the gospel message uh, to serve those who are marginalized and excluded in any way. Uh, Catholic social teaching, uh, the principles of Catholic social teachings are include the option for the poor, dignity of the human person, solidarity, the search for the common good, the dignity of work and rights of workers, and care for God's creation. And, and finally, the uh, universal apostolic preferences, which are the fruit of a process of discernment and uh, reflection, and are to be a guide, a reference point for our work um, in the Jesuit uh, world. And they are one, showing the way to God, walking with the excluded, journeying with youth, and finally caring for our common home. And so these three things are what guide our work and our discernment and our priorities. So who are the poor today? And, and why are they poor? So, uh, when part of our, our reflection calls us to read the signs of the times, you know, we ask, uh, what's our context? Where are we working? Whose voices are we hearing? Whose voices are we not hearing? Who benefits from the current state of affairs? And, and, and what is God saying to us? Um, and so if we look at the current of the world today, we see that in Canada, a high proportion of the poor are indigenous people the first inhabitants of 
Turtle Island, who still today are suffering exclusion, poverty, racism, violence, and also includes lack of organizational, um, of, of educational opportunities. We also see poverty and exclusion among urban poor, refugees, undocumented migrants, and, and casual workers. Then we have the global south. So many countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America are experiencing extreme levels of poverty among vast sectors of the population. And thirdly, we need to say that in addition, uh, both nationally and internationally, the gap between the rich and the poor within countries has grown, uh, which has led to extreme wealth uh, among a few people and poverty for many in poor, both in poor and rich countries. So even though there's been growth in emerging countries, we see from the slide that the uh, richest 10% uh, of the um, uh, the uh, of the global population currently takes 52% of global income, while the poorest half only have 8%. And um, one thing to add to that is that women uh, bear the brunt of this. So women's share of total income from work uh, stands at 35% today. And uh, you know, one, one indication is literacy. So 758 million adults are illiterate, and of these, two thirds are women. With uh, and, and we can see why uh, today there are 130 million girls out of school. So why is that? Uh, well, uh, these things are not an accident. It's not the will of God. Uh, this is the result of policies and decisions that are made, whereby uh, at every level of society and the economy uh, are structured in a way that it benefits a few while the majority are left behind. So why is education important in this uh, context? Um, so uh, I wanna say three things under this section. So why is education important? So the first one is education is a human right. So, um, so in the next slide, uh, uh, Jose, if you can pass. So the, Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, everyone has a right to education. Education shall be free, at least in the elementary uh, and fundamental stages, and elementary uh, education is to be compulsory. This right is enshrined in the Convention of the Rights of the Child and affirmed by the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly Goal 4, uh, which calls for the universal access to quality education. And so at this point, I want you to hear from two women. I was recently in, um, in India and in Nepal. And uh, one is a, a young woman, Sanju, who was uh, participated for three months in an internship in the Nepal Jesuit uh, Social Center programs, which is offered specifically for girls as to offer extra tutoring. And the second one is a young woman in Matigara, India, part of the Darjeeling province of the Jesuits. Her name is Ritu Pana, and she works with the Human Life Development and Research Center, which is an initiative of the Jesuits of the Darjeeling province, which focuses on a rights-based approach to development. So you may have difficulties understanding, but don't worry. After I want you to feel their passion and their their personality and then I will summarize what they say if you are not able to understand everything so let's li let's listen to them okay so first of all tell me your name okay my name is Sanzu Kesi okay Sanzu Kesi yes. so tell me uh what you do right now I do teaching in Don Bosco school okay what do you teach I teach uh, grammar and moral science. And moral science, yeah. okay. So tell me, what is your association with the Nepal Jesuit Social Institute? Okay. Actually, I was uh, Catholic, so in church also I was totally linked with the father and sisters. Okay. And then I was totally linked. When I was linked to, is uh, with the saint and sister because they are uh, uh, teaching us computer and all those things. No, okay. after that only I could link to the father directly. 
Okay. So you, what did you come here to do? You came from school? Yeah. And tell us a little bit. You spent, how much time did you spend here? Uh, right now? No, before, when you came. You spent three months here? Yeah, I spent three months. Okay. And you learned computer? Yeah, I learned computer, Microsoft, and Excel. Okay. And even uh, some work of secretary. Okay. Right. So can you tell us what difference did that make in your life? Okay. Those the, three months, what difference did it make? Okay, there was a lot of difference, I know, which made, like, uh, when, right now, I'm uh, teaching, so most of the time, what, I have to take out the videos for students, and even for, uh, I have to make questions, and all those things, I have, I'm, I learned that computer, so I can easily type, types, and then I can easily make the question for myself, and okay. even I can make a PowerPoint to present my, some of the works in the school. Okay. And so those skills yeah. have allowed you to then go to college. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You went from your from school, yes, yeah, from high school, then you came here and, and then, then you went I, to college. College. And so being here allowed you to do that. Yeah. So um I want to ask you, uh what uh do you think why do you think it's important to have education that girls get educated yeah it is very important look nowadays is the 21st century and almost the people are educated no if we don't get educated like it's look like a blind people walking on the road and it's totally nowadays is important whether it should be boys or girls it doesn't matter but education should be provided for each and everyone and it doesn't matter in education so that's it. And what do you think are some of the obstacles for girls? To yeah, be there are lots of obstacles. Like for me also, now I have already done my bachelor and I'm waiting for, I'm I'm hoping to do my master as well. But what my economical condition is very low, no? Mm -hmm. So I can't join the master. So I have uh, give off one year back. So I will collect the monies and then I will join my master for next year. Okay, so That's economics right. is yeah. one obstacle because you want to tell us a little bit about your family. Is your family yeah. like poor or can they afford? Yeah, they are not like poor also, but they are average, you know. Right. And then for average family or for a middle class family, what happened? Most of the time, what they have to work. You know? right. Even my parents are working a lot because my mother is doing agriculture mm -hmm. and she has to see the, all the household things and my father work yeah he work in Kaidas Nepal but what happened is he has his own duties no he have to take his son to take studies and look studies and even he is a one uh, he's not good at health also he have to look for him and then the mother is the one who hold the all household things and then I am the one because that uh, the amount of salary I get is very low no? so it will I'm saving for my education as well, and I'm for saving my allowance also. I can't give the, uh, my salary to my family, right. so, so it's very... Really... So uh, other than economics, are there other obstacles? Is there other reasons why yeah, girls can't Yeah, uh, other reasons also, because, of, you know, after the certain age that girls should be get married, you know, why to get studies? Because you are already going to get married, you know. Some of my friends are even saying that, but it doesn't matter nowadays. You know, you have to keep up your mind open. Likewise, in a, and then uh, in a Nepali society, what they have narrow-minded people, you know. Still, they are not educated. So most of the time, what happened? People think like, now stop uh, reading. Let's get for a marriage. It's a time for you to get married, you know. Okay. Some of the relatives and come and save me like that, but but still, it's my right to get education. So I am struggling all those things. Well, congratulations! Yeah. That's great. Well, all congratulations for all that you have achieved. Yeah. You're a great example and inspiration to new girls. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, that's great. So um, we're going to listen to uh, one more um, from Ritu, and then maybe I'll uh, have a little summary of what they said. If uh, uh, if we want to see the other video number two. Uh, what did you study? I studied UNSA in the local it's, uh, ICC board. Okay. Yeah, with lots of, I have, like, I have seen, I have faced, my parents have faced lots of struggle, and they taught us. Mm -hmm. They gave us education. They gave the priority to education. Like we didn't have uh, even if even though we didn't have food to eat, but they gave prior, priority to education. 
so since then like it stuck in my mind that yeah people should like the children should get education especially the tea garden area students because they are deprived of education the parents they don't know the importance of education so in the upcoming years i would like to with we the team would like to reach the maximum tea garden area so that we would give the awareness and we would uh, tell them the meaning and importance of education what is the importance like today i am sitting here and uh, doing interaction with you as a successful lady so mm-hmm. likewise i would like to see all the tea garden students children like in the future like that that's great it's our right to know through education only we we get to know about everything about the knowledge and all through education so obviously we have the right to know everything everything means each and everything each and every knowledge the studies the history the geography the all the subjects like yeah. right so um so here are these two young women and uh the the thing that is um for me uh, was very important to share with you is the fact that uh, they both finished their their uh, little uh response to my questions by saying it is my right it is my right to get an education uh sanju said that that i don't know if you were able to understand but she speaks about how she had to she really wanted to study and she learned a lot of computer skills thanks to the work at the uh with the nepal jesuit uh um, social institute where they provide this tutoring for especially for girls that come from public schools where they have received no computer training where there's very limited um facilities for to learn and so they give them an opportunity before they go to college and so she said what a she said what when i said what are the obstacles she mentioned poverty and the fact that she has to save to her parents cannot support her and secondly she said the some of the cultural factors that there's pressure to get married and people feel you don't need to be educated and she said it doesn't matter we have to keep our mind open and i have a right to be educated and and that that was the same message from ritu pana at the human life development and research center in matigara in darjeeling province where uh they have a rights based approach and people are very keen in getting education as a human right and she uh, is emphasizes how her team their team wants to in- ensure that children in the tea gardens get education and once again she said it is our right to know things and to know everything she said um and so hldrc uh, works in 37 study centers uh which are totally free for formal uh, for non-formal education for children to uh to help adivasis and indigenous tea estate workers children So the second uh the second point about uh why education is important so one is human rights secondly is because education is fundamental to peace stability and security so education can set the basis for resolution of conflict and for building peace uh secondly in emergencies in conflict uh, war post conflict situations schools provide a safe place and protect children So as an example in Nepal after the earthquake of 2015 the focus of the emergency response on the part of the Jesuits there supported by CJI and the Xavier network was to rebuild public schools which had been destroyed after the earthquake when i visited shortly after the earthquake uh schools had been destroyed kids were left with nothing to do some were left orphans others had to work and in that context human traffickers took advantage of this and the number of cases of trafficked children from nepal grew significantly because they were unprotected so the emergency response was to get kids back to school as soon as possible and we see the same emphasis placed in the work that the jesuit refugee service is doing in lebanon and in uh, south sudan these are places where there is a conflict or post conflict situation and that's the focus is on education 
And you can read about some of this in our latest newsletter of CJI, which is focused is on education. And they speak specifically about the context in Lebanon. Thirdly, education is as a determinant of health, development, and human rights. So education is often uh, referred to as a multiplier right. So what this means is that it enables people to access other human rights. The UN Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights says that it is also, education is also the primary vehicle by which socially and economic marginalized adults and children can lift themselves out of poverty. And so here, I want to uh, let you hear Noreen. There's a lot of noise in the background, but I think you'll be really able to hear what she has to say about uh, education. She's from Hayden Hall, former associate director of Hayden Hall in Darjeeling. Education is what levels the playing field for the rich, the middle class, and the poor. So very often, many the, the why it's so important for the poor, whether you're ma male or female, is because it gives you not just information that you can get in today's world from Google, but it gives you informed opinions. It gives you the ability to think for yourself. That is why I am so unhappy with the rise of rightism, with the rise of autocracy across the world. So education, as you must have noticed in places like Afghanistan and Yemen, very, the women are always discriminated. Why? Because they say women should be doing women's jobs. There is no women's job. It is a stereotype that has made women remain underdeveloped all these years. And if you look around Aden Hall, all the paramedics that we have chosen for our health program, for our nutrition program, are all women. Now why? Not only because we work with women and children, but because they have a sense of continuity, sustainability, they have compassion. Okay, so so that was Noreen, and she is um, uh, she used she was the former social director of Hayden Hall, and um, even though um, and so you can see how she, if you were able to understand. She talks about the work that Hayden Hall has been doing for decades is to train women health workers uh, because um, she says that, you know, that the paramedics are women because they work with women, but also because they, uh, they, they, the women are the ones who in the communities can support uh, community health. And, and she said, education helps you think for yourself. Even though uh, we have to note that uh, education in itself is not enough. It's not, if it's not accompanied by social and economic changes, work opportunities, and measure to reduce poverty. And we'll talk about that a bit later. So the next section is why girls education in particular. And in this section, I want to talk about three things. One is I want to say a few things about the current state of girls education. Two, I want to talk about the barriers to girls' education and the impact of investing in girls' education. So um, if we, uh, worldwide, there are about 130 million girls that are out of school and uh, only not even half of the countries in the world have achieved gender parity in primary education. So if you go to the next slide, um, you can see these uh, statistics. And at a secondary level, secondary school level, the, this gap is even wider. Then in situation of war, girls are more than twice as likely to be out of school than girls in non-affected countries. And in places like Afghanistan, uh, they, they can't even attend secondary school. So let's look at what are the reasons, what are the barriers to uh, girls' education? So first one is poverty. We already heard it from one of the girls who spoke earlier. This is the most 
significant obstacle to for girls access and for completion of their especially secondary school or tertiary school. Secondly, is attitudes towards girls' education and cultural factors, especially in places where child marriage and teenage pregnancy are common. And again, we heard that from uh, two of the girls or young women earlier. So in my recent trip to Nepal, we visited a public school in a very poor rural area. And I noted that uh, there were more girls than boys in the school. And I, I took that as a good sign. I was a bit surprised. But in the next video, listen to how Father Roy Sebastian explains this. He is the director of the Nepal Jesuit Social Center Institute. And, uh, uh, and his intervention is then followed by a testimony by Rina, a young woman who has been also a beneficiary of the internship program that we saw earlier. So I'm going to ask if we can see these videos. So, Father Roy from uh, the Nepal Jesuit Social Institute, I, today when we visited the government school in a rural area, it was obvious uh, the children are very, very poor. They come from very poor communities and the school is obviously very poor uh, and you're working there. But I noticed that there were, um, it seemed that there be, were as many girls as boys. Can you tell me about the proportion of girls to boys and how girls' education is seen here? Yes, um, this is the same thing we also noticed. Uh, initially, I thought there are more girls in the school because uh, there is more consciousness about the education of the women. So, so there are more girls coming. And then I asked the question, where are the boys? Are they not coming to school? Then the teachers told and the local people told, the boys are selected by the parents to go to the good schools, the private schools in the city. They stay in hostels and so mm. forth. So there is a clear gender discrimination from the family itself. The parents prefer to educate the boys than the girls. The girls are left back in the government schools. So that is one of the reasons that we go to the government school so that educating the girls will be the possibility of educating the whole country because they remain back in the country and in the rural sector and in the family and they care for the young ones. Thank you. Can you tell me also, do girls finish school up to uh, grade, uh, I don't know, uh, grade 12 or do, is there a high dropout level? Yes, um, there is about 40% dropout we've been recorded in Nepal over the years from the school, from class 7 to 10 and 12. You, for boys and girls. For boys and girls. You can do that. And what I want to say was the girls very often after class 10 or 12, which is the high school, get into marriage there. Because the parents are worried uh, they should be immediately sent out of the house. So that is one of the mindset of the people that somehow get the girl married and then the burden is of the family, you know. So that is something which is actually affecting the, the dropout of girls and there's a lot of dropouts in this. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. And maybe we can just move to um, Rina Soren, the next video, uh, number five. So what have you learned here in these six months? Uh, I learned uh, computer, uh, basic things in computer, uh, like MS Word, uh, MS Paint, PowerPoint, Photoshop, and Open Twinge. As I said, uh, in Open, Open Twinge is a software for the production of 2D animation. Uh, this animation course, uh, uh, I learned and it is useful for me uh, because uh, with the help of this animation course I could uh, um, I could uh, uh, explain di different uh, concept with the help of visual representation and uh, I, along with uh, computer training course I learned English and uh, personality development and, and yes many other uh, many other things I learned. Excellent. Do you want to tell me a little bit where you come from? Like what, where, where, where does your family live? Uh, what kind of, what kind of environment was it? Um, we live in village. Uh, it is village and the 
we belong to ethnic community uh, it is one of the backward community of nepal and most of people are not educated and then um, in, now also they are not educated and uh, from my family also our parents are not educated so they have uh, given us with good education mm. and uh, want to right study. so your parent do your parents know how to read and write your parents um, just a little bit, little little bit. Little. but they felt it was important for you to go to school yes okay and why do you think it's important to go to school especially for a girl yes it is important for the girls because uh, i have seen in my places also many girls are not educated uh, uh, they are getting early marriages and facing all the all those domestic problems and uh, with lack of education they are facing lots of problems okay so education has made a difference in your life yes education has made different different in my life what's the next step for you uh, i want to uh, study i want to do my higher studies mm -hmm. and uh, go off with career okay mm -hmm. what would you like to be i want to be I want to work as a, I want to be social worker. You want to be a social worker. Yes. You want to give back to your community. Yes. Okay, well, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good luck. Eh? So there we are. So we heard, um, I hope you were able to understand. I mean, I find that amazing that Venus just learned English in those six months. And I think she did a great job. Um, she's very smart. Um, so. I think we, we both heard, we heard, so Father Roy uh, talked about, it turns out that the, the number, the higher number of girls in a public school is actually a false positive because um, it, the reason is that if people have limited resources, then we, they will choose the boys to take them to a private school where they can get better education because the, the level of public education in India, in Nepal is very, very poor. And so, um, and so, uh, so therefore, as he said, there is gender discrimination, and that's why we see more girls in the in the public school. And you know, he talked about uh, the dropout rate, uh, very high among uh, students overall. And and Rena made reference also to uh, the importance of education, and that uh, you know, as a way to counter child marriage and to 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 advance in life and it, she comes from as she said a very poor family but um she said the village girls are getting uh, early marriage but they're facing lots of problems she said and education has made a huge difference in her life so i she was very inspiring very full of life so it was a, it was a real pleasure to meet her so so that's the traditional attitudes the third uh thing i want to mention in terms of obstacles or barriers to girls' education is the lack of safety, hygiene, and, and, and sanitary, uh, 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 sanitation that responds to girls' needs. So uh, it is estimated that almost 250 million children experience violence around school, in or around school every year, according to UNESCO. Uh, girls... Uh, who are forced to lo walk long distance. That I have met kids who have walked four hours to school every day. Uh, they risk, uh, in, you know, increased um, uh, violence. It was estimated in 2012 that 60 million girls are sexually assaulted on their way to or from school. So that's one big issue. Secondly, is uh, the hygiene and sanitation facilities. So there are international standards. The SPHERE standards are a set of international set uh, minimum standards for humanitarian emergencies, which are adapted to local culture. They say, these standards, that as a minimum, washrooms should have water, should have doors that lock from the inside. They should have adequate lighting for safety and they should have adequate menstrual hygiene management facilities and supplies. But uh, in many places, these do not exist. And therefore it's estimated that one in 10 girls in Sub-Saharan Africa miss school during their menstrual cycle. And so this uh, equals to about 20% of a given school year. In India, one in five girls drop out of school after they get their period. 
So you can imagine the impact that this has on girls' education. The fourth uh, reason is migratory status. So nearly half of all the refugee children in the world are out of school. Uh, refugees are often denied school in the host countries because they fear that if education is provided, the refugees will have no incentive to go back home. And, uh, and there's also the issue of lack of resources. If the host community doesn't have resources for education, they uh, resent refugees uh, having them. And finally, I want to mention uh, the impact of COVID-19 on education. COVID-19 had a huge impact on girls' education. Uh, it is, UNESCO estimates that 11 million girls may never return to school. Uh, girls aged 12 to 17 in particular were at a particular risk of dropping out of school in low and lower income countries, while in middle, upper middle and high income countries, the risk is more for boys not to return to school after COVID. So there's a real difference here. And uh, are the many things around education, and I'm speaking about the reality of the global South. It, there was an increase in adolescent pregnancies, forced marriages, uh, which further threatens girls' education. Millions of children lost their parents uh, or their primary caregiver. And then finally, um, disparities in the internet and technology access. In India, we were told uh, that 43% of students had no access to online classes. Uh, so when you have over 2 billion people, 2.2 billion people below the age of 25 are lacking internet access in the home, children and adolescents around the world have not been able to access inclusive and quality education during COVID-19. And most students that I met now had uh, no, don't have, uh, in India and Nepal that I met, they had no home internet. They have uh, some computer classes at school, but usually no internet access. And that further increases the divide between the North and the South. Um, so the, the, the next uh, point of piece I want to talk about is what is the impact of investing in girls' education? Uh, so Investing in girls' education has an impact on communities, countries, and the world. Uh, what are some of the changes we see in those communities and countries who invest in girls', girls education? The lifetime earnings of girls increases dramatically. National growth rate rise. Child marriage rates decrease. Child mortality rates fall. There is irrefutable evidence that women's education has a statistically significant impact in under five child mortality rate, more than a change in economic development or modernization. Women's education is what has a huge impact. Maternal mortality rates fall. So basically there's long-term impact in society and the health and survival of everyone in the community because a number of factors, families are better educated about nutrition and other, other factors. So uh, let's listen now to another video uh, of another uh, woman who studied at the Nepal Jesuit Social Institute, video number six. Hi, so first of all, tell me your name. My name is Riza Nasai. Okay, and tell me what you do. Now I am uh, in bank. Uh, I am doing job in Sunrise Bank Limited. Okay, and so what's your association with the Nepal Jesuit Social Institute? Oh, when I was um, I'm studying in bachelor level, then I have got an opportunity to associate with NJ Society. Then I got opportunity to to uh, study my. Uh, computer course and personality development and English mm. development language so that helped me a lot uh, because I am public school okay. uh, there is no computer courses and uh, no English more only one subject we okay. read that time but it helped so much so what you're saying is in a public school you had no computer classes yes, you yes, had no, no English and, and so 
coming here helped you to improve and allowed you to go to college. Yes. Okay. And so, so it's made a big change, difference yes. in your life. Yes, yes, it's a life turning point. I can say it. <laughs> that life is turning, turning point. point. Yes. Life turning point. point. Okay. And so, tell me, uh, why, why do you think it's important to educate girls? Education girls is most important because a girl is everything. Uh, everywhere we are, if girl is educated, full, full family, whole family. Got it. Got education, and they can uh, teach what they know, and uh, for whole family can be educated, updated about the things. If a boy, only boy, there is lack of only one boy will be educated. There is no transformation of education. That's why. Okay. And do you think that now uh, in Nepal, girls and boys have the same opportunity? Um, now time has been changed, but uh, everybody, every village are, are not getting same same chances. But uh, recently, this uh, area, city areas are getting chances, but not everywhere. Okay, <laughs> right. So there's still barriers. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for this with and good luck. Thank you. Congratulations. Yes, okay. Thank you. Great. So um, maybe we'll skip the next video because I'm just keeping an eye on the time. And if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll see Noreen again. But uh, I wanted to uh, talk a bit about um, well-being versus agency. So uh, here I quote from Amartya Sen, who is a, a well-known Indian economist and writer. And um, if we look at the next uh, slide, he says, agency has to do with the pursuit of goals and objectives that a person has reason to value in advance, whether or not they're connected with the person's own well-being. So in other words, we're not only concerned with the welfare of people, say by providing food or free health care, but we want to incorporate the role of women as agents in doing things, assessing priorities, formulating policies, and carrying out programs. Uh, we're uh, concerned with the expansion of women's capabilities since it affects every field of society's life. So I want to share the story here of the women we met in Rohini, which is a slum in Delhi. And they offer an example of this. Uh, Lok Manch, which is a, uh, means People's Forum. It's a program which is um, an initiative countrywide of uh, the Jesuits across India who work with other organizations and people's social movements to empower people to seek their social and economic rights. And we have been supporting them. And the women in this particular neighborhood, which is, I have to say, one of probably the most, uh, um, uh, the worst, one of the worst times I have visited, uh, the women have taken leadership in this uh, area. And we met them. They're strong and they're courageous. And they, one of the priorities they identified was to have their own clinic in the neighborhood. And they fought and fought with the government until they got it. And they were very proud of their accomplishment because it was the result of their agency, of their effort. It was not a handout. And so uh, I want to, um, some of the young women here uh, are the, the daughters and uh, uh, some of the women that were involved with whom we met in a room full of women and young people who wanted to, to talk to us. And uh, the translation, it's mostly in Hindi, but there, she missed uh, Father uh, George Peter, who is a Jesuit director of the Loyola, Loyola Education Institute, translates parts of it. And then we can summarize at the end, but it gives you a sense of the strength uh, of these women. So let's watch this. So I want to ask them, her or anybody, uh, why do they think education is a human right? And why is girls' education important? Because so I can, we can tell people. Shiksha Mahatapurna hai. Vishesh is said, Mahila, 
बहुत जरूरत है क्योंकि एक लड़की के लिए बहुत ही ज्यादा इम्पोर्टेंट लगता है एजुकेशन बिकॉज एजुकेशन के थ्रू वो अपना एक महत्व जान पाती है अपनी एक पर्सनैलिटी को समझ पाती है कि वो क्या है सबसे पहले क्योंकि अनएजुकेटेड लोग हमेशा उसे ये बताते हैं कि तुम कुछ नहीं कुछ नहीं ठीक है और एजुकेशन के थ्रू वो बहुत कुछ जान पाती है जैसे कि उसका सर ने शादी होने के बाद एक लड़की शादी होती है तो उसका सर नेम चेंज हो जाता है लेकिन उसका कोई अस्तित्व नहीं रहता लेकिन जब वो पढ़ लेती है तो वो अपने पैरों पे खड़ा होना चाहती है उसके लिए वो आगे कॉलेज जाती है स्कूल जाती है फिर वो कहते और हायर एजुकेशन लेती है जिससे कि वो वकील बनती है और भी और भी फील्ड में अपना वो विशेष महत्व देती है जिसके कारण उसका एक नाम बनता है उसके नाम के वजह से फैमिली का नाम बनता है समाज का बनता है आखिर उसे भी एक बार एक टाइम पे उसे भी उसके नाम से उसके परिवार को भी समझा जाता है उसके परिवार को भी जाना और पहचाना जाता है और पह, और क्या पहले की स्त्रियां कैसे थी जो अनएजुकेटेड थी उन्हें वो एक तरफ से घूम हो जाती थी पहले पर, अपने मायके में रहना मायके के सरनेम से जाने जाना फिर बाद में अपने ससुराल जाना वहां के सरनेम से जाने जाना फिर एक दिन वो खत्म हो जाती थी घूंघट में रह जाना घूंघट में उसका अस्तित्व खत्म हो जाता है लेकिन अब जब से एजुकेशन आ गया है तब से जो महिलाएं हैं वो इतनी ज्यादा सक्षम हो गई हैं कि उनकी उनके उनकी पॉपुलैरिटी पूरा वर्ष विश्व अच्छे से समझता है एजुकेशन मेक्स अ वुमन अदरवाइज शी हैज नो एक्सिस्टेंस शी इज इधर शी इज नोन बाय द सरनेम ऑफ हर फादर अंटिल मैरिज एंड आफ्टर मैरिज हर सरनेम इज हर हस्बैंड सो हर ओन लाइफ हैज नो मीनिंग शी हैज नो एक्सिस्टेंस सो शी एजुकेशन विल गिव अ सेल्फ रिलायंस इंडिपेंडेंस freedom of thinking and a future something to look forward to and she will have an existence on this earth as a person otherwise she is nobody she is somebody else's is always care of so she becomes atmanirbhar she becomes self reliant independent education ke liye education ke liye khud ko jaane jaati hai और वो खुद को रिप्रेजेंट कर पाती है नहीं तो एजुकेशन नहीं होता तो उसे कोई दुनिया भी नहीं जाती पूरा आप सेल्फ नॉलेज मिलता है सेल्फ अवेयरनेस मिलता है एंड शी नोस व्हाट इज माय रोल एंड कैपेसिटी सो आई शुड बी एबल टू कंट्रीब्यूट टू द सोसाइटी रादर देन जस्ट बिकम जीरो वेरी गुड बहुत अच्छा और इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर अस आर द पीपल वी आर लिविंग अराउंड इट एंड इफ यू कैन डू समथिंग फॉर देम सो व्हाट काइंड ऑफ एजुकेशन वी आर गेटिंग लाइक आई एम एवरी डे आई पास थ्रू दिस एरिया एंड एवरी वेयर द गार्बेज इज ड्रम एंड इफ आई एम नॉट एबल टू डू एनीथिंग फॉर माय ओन सोसाइटी सो व्हाट काइंड ऑफ एजुकेशन आई एम गेटिंग शी इज आल्सो अ ट्यूशन टीचर टीचर आई मीन शी इज टीचिंग टीच फ्रॉम this uh, institute uh, uh, yeah i told now we have four tuitions at this for the government school for yeah. children so she is one of the teachers who else you don't teach no yes yes i am also teacher one of the two one of the four yes yes acha this is i'm not from that uh, loyola i'm from uh, my my university so you got lot of confidence and lot of motivation to work in the sector so for example you know, now you will be provided good job good salary good uh, location will you still continue with this community sir actually i am preparing for civil services so uh, definitely i will i will go for jobs because money is everything for us in today's society so we need to improve ourselves every day so uh, after even getting education or any reputed job i would definitely do something for the society that doesn't mean if i get the job i will leave but you will go you will go you will yeah. leave this kind of work and you will go yeah. join there yeah. no, so that she will be able to do like, more i will be able to, to do more in the is but the society like this time i don't have there. anything except time like i can just give time to society and nothing else then if i get the job if i get if i become a civil servant uh, a civil servant then i would have power money to so that i could do more efficiently for the society So this is all this is. Okay, so well, this was a very spirited conversation we had with them. We just took a couple of snippets. Uh, they um, so it um, you know both of them spoke of uh, 
uh, how uh, you know uh, uh, Father George translated how uh, education makes a woman; otherwise, she has no existence, and that's what uh, Sunita said. And uh, she is known by somebody else's last name. And education gives self reliance, self knowledge, self awareness, independence, so that they can have an existence as a person. So uh, that was her message. And the message of Anupam was if I can't do anything for my society, what kind of education am, am I getting? So she sees education as a way to then do something for her community and her society. So these are two young women, and there were many more uh, for whom, um, you know, agency and well being are two different things, and they require different approach to the work we do. Uh, the role of the person as an agent is different from the role of a person as a beneficiary or a victim. And, uh, and when women become agents, they can transform not only their own lives, but that of the whole community. So, um, why? Uh, why let's move to the last uh, section of uh, of this presentation which is why does a jesuit organization like uh, cji care about uh, girls education uh, what does it have to do with the jesuit mission and spirituality and uh, what are the initiatives that we we are supporting uh, well first of all i want to say that you know uh, <laughs> we all know this, but I want to say the Jesuits are not the only ones uh, working on education, nor are they necessarily at the forefront. There are many organizations, uh, NGOs uh, uh, and other church organizations, and especially women's or, uh, congregations that have provided and continue to provide education to children and girls in particular all over the global south. And uh, uh, they do so because they have recognized the fundamental fundamental importance of girls' education on, for society's well-being. And so, uh, and I want to mention the Loretto sisters because our office is located at Loretto College. So going back to the beginning of this presentation, we talked about our the roots of our mission. And so it, it's, I believe that education and girls in education in particular, education for, for people in the margins and among them we find girls in particular, it's integral to our mission as a Jesuit institution because of the option of the, for the poor that we mentioned earlier, because it is a way to live out the universal apostolic preferences. And I want to mention here next um, that even Pope Francis has underscored the essential place of education and of girls' education. Uh, so during the Global Compact on Education event in 2020, Pope Francis made seven points about education and among which he listed the need to encourage the full participation of girls and young women in education. And so in his address, uh, in January 2023 uh, to the Diplomatic Corps, Corps he uh, said uh, that there's a crisis in education, which is made even more acute by the effects of the pandemic and the geopolitical scenario. So people are displaced, wars, and he, he wishes to made the states find the courage the courage to reverse the embarrassing and disproportionate relationship between public funding for education and expenditures on armaments. And you know, when I was in uh, in India recently, um, they I was told by John Ravi, who is in charge of the uh, education for the Easy Assistant to the Conference on Education, that. Um, in the, in, no government in India has ever spent more than 4% of GDP on education, even though current legislation says that 6% should be spent on education. So I want to end with uh, some um, slides, uh, just some mention of some of the education projects that we support. Uh, um, that Jesuits are running, Jesuit institutions, others, and that we support. So I want to mention the educational projects in India and Nepal. You have already seen several examples today. Um, and education is a priority there. We were told that 60% of the Jesuits in India are assigned to education. 
with a focus on providing quality education to all. And there is zero tolerance for, or they're trying to have zero tolerance for dropping out. And uh, uh, the special focus on uh, education of T state workers who are among the most excluded and uh, marginalized people. They focus on teacher training and also integral education, which includes music and art. And here, for example, you see a photo of a little girl in a Gandhi ashram who is uh, uh, learning how to play. Uh, they're all like that school teaches kids music, you know, violin and uh, 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 viola, etc. And uh, there's also a dance and music institute in the province where, which is buzzing with activity on weekends for a lot of children who would otherwise not have the experience of having a more holistic education have that experience. Um, I did have another video, but I'm not sure we have time for that. So maybe I'll, uh, uh, there's a video from, because we wanna leave a bit of time for questions. Um, I had a video of the mothers of Moron Memorial School. Um, maybe we'll just leave that for a minute. And maybe we can see, I want to talk about some of the work. Uh, another large initiative uh, is the Jesuit Refugee Service. And uh, we support some of the projects of Jesuit Refugee Service. It's an organization founded by Father Pedro Arupe, who which is now present in 50 countries to support refugees and forcibly displaced people. Uh, education is one of the four key areas of work, and it is currently educating and training 360,000 people throughout the world. They have a little video. This is their video. Uh, it's a little better quality. <laughs> so maybe if we can watch that, if possible, it gives us a bit of a... Uh, an overview of the um, of the education work of the Jesuit uh, Refugee Service. I don't know whether um, uh, whether it's possible or not, but maybe I'll just give you a little extra time. Uh, um, I'm Jenny. I'm already sharing the the video. I don't know. If okay, you can see it. I cannot see it, but maybe the others can. I'll try. And if not, don't worry. If I could create the world of tomorrow, I would draw a world where our children can go to school and discover their full potential. But I didn't grow up in this kind of world. I was a refugee. When I was only two years old, I was forced to flee from my country. For six years, I journeyed by foot across different countries before I found safety in a refugee camp in Malawi. There, I got the opportunity to go to school and pursue my education. Now I'm a doctor and I'm giving back to my community by advocating for education for refugees. Education changed my life, and it can also change the lives of many other refugees if they are given the opportunity to study. Today, half of the refugee children in the world are out of school, and only 1% of refugees have a chance at higher education. Imagine refugee children feeling safe and protected at school, feeling safe from child labor, sexual exploitation, armed group recruitment, or early marriage. Education plays a critical role in sustaining and sometimes even saving lives. Imagine what they can accomplish if they are all given the possibility to go to school and even attend university. Through the Global Education Initiative, JRS strives to reshape the current refugee reality by enabling their journey from the ground up. We are getting more refugee children into primary school and keeping them in secondary school. We are making more access to university and vocational training possible. Let's stop imagining. Let's make it a reality. Are you with me?
Okay, so that gives a little quick summary of uh, some of the work, but also the motivation behind the work of um, the Jesuit Refugee Service. Another one that I wanted to um, mention is, um, if we go to the next slide, is the uh, Fe Alegria, which is a network of, uh, it was founded in 1955 in Venezuela, uh, but it's uh, now, um, uh, is present in over 22 countries. And its motto is, um, you see there, Fe Alegria, this is what the founder said, begins where the asphalt ends, where drinking water does not drip, where the city loses its name. In other words, it's there where the poor are. And so it's, um, uh, if, if um, just move the, the uh, it's present in all these countries, 22 countries, mostly in Latin America, but it's now expanded and growing in um, Africa and in Asia. And so there are, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's got 43,000 staff, 930,000 uh, participants. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, it works in urban rural sectors where the, uh, to support public education, it's all public education. The teacher's salaries are funded by the, the government, but providing it's run by, uh, by the Jesuits. Because the motto is, don't give the poor a poor education. And we support a couple of their projects, one being the Amazon Bilingual Education Program in, uh, 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 that supports bilingual education and indigenous language and the care for our common home. The, the next last one I wanted to mention was the, the work of the Jesuits in South Sudan, uh, uh, sowing seeds of social transformation. And as you can see there, um, there are a number of uh, uh, projects that uh, related to education there. There's Loyola Secondary School, uh, St. Peter Claver Computer and Ecological Center. There's a teacher's training college and a multi-educational and agricultural Jesuit Institute of South Sudan. So these are all um, as part of this program. And uh, they and it's a program that we have been, been supporting for, uh, for a long time. So I'll end with, and these are some photos of that program. So we can just move forward with those. These are just different. So I just want to end with uh, what are some of the challenges. Now, we probably would need another hour to, to go through some of the challenges um, and, and that are we face in this work. Can you see, as you've seen, the issues that are immense. And uh, one of the key um, the first thing we need to address is poverty. As you have heard from many of the testaments, and I know we missed a couple of them, but it's um, we have to address the issue of poverty and equality because that is at the root of uh, why there's no access to education. But secondly, we have to work at the level of educational policy. We have to do advocacy to increase public funding for education by governments. Of the 29 countries surveyed all across regions, two thirds of low and lower middle income countries have cut their education budgets since the onset of COVID-19. And this uh, will affect children mostly in the global south. It will affect girls. And the, the, um, it, it, it's only even countries in, in the upper middle and higher income countries have reduced their budget, but a third as opposed to, to what we have seen in the um, lower and middle income countries. So um, we have to ensure also that our international aid and the solidarity, including what CJI does, is gender responsive education, supports gender responsive education. We have to be attentive to that because it doesn't all happen automatically. And we have a gendered response to emergency. So as we have seen, catastrophic events affect the poor and marginalize even and divide the increase the divide between rich and poor. And so, um, and, and uh, I want to mention also the um, 
the, the, the tension there is between private and public education, because in India and Nepal, they talk to us about that, you know, the, the, the governments are the only ones that can sustain quality public education for all, uh, just like they do in our countries. But in countries where governments allocate 3% of their GDP, how do you provide quality education? But then um, private schools either charge fees therefore excluding the poor, or they have to depend on international aid, which is not sustainable. So that's a, a real dilemma. And, and finally, we, we do have to support education for forcibly displaced children. Otherwise, years are missed, and this will have a huge impact. So I want to end um, with uh, leaving the last words to uh, two women. Uh, Shristi and with uh, Noreen Dunn, uh, who will, um, it's, a, it's our way to, to finish this presentation. So if we could just watch the last two videos, number 10 and 11, please. So, hi, first of all, give me, tell me your name. Uh, my name is Shristi Tapa. Okay. I was born and brought up in Kathmandu, Nepal. I joined NJSI in 2017. Okay. Right. Uh, I was doing my master's and side by side I joined NJSI. I finished my master's uh, doing uh, NJSI, I mean, simultaneously with the work. Mm. I first uh, was recruited as an office coordinator, mm. then I got promoted to the director level. Very nice. So I just want to ask you, why do you think this work is important? Why do you like working here? In social work? Uh, from the beginning only, from my childhood only, I always was connected to the people and the society. I never dreamt of becoming a doctor or engineer. I always wanted to connect with the community and the people. I love, I mean, do things for the people. I am from, I mean, my, that is my, what do you say? Uh, inner my natural quality or something like that okay. so, and I, that, that's the way I head to the and bachelors I joined the social work so I end up here okay and just tell me just to finish what why do you think this work that the Institute does is important for the lives of people in Nepal in Nepal mm -hmm. uh, it's Nepal is like a very it's an underdeveloped country so if you see the Kathmandu, then it's developed. But if you see around, I mean, outside the Kathmandu Valley, there is a, I mean, the people are uneducated, mm. the underprivileged ones. We have different ethnic groups, especially, and they are uneducated. So for them, we have to work. Okay. Uh, they are always behind the curtains. Mm. They are always underprivileged. They don't get things. Uh, I think you see the videos and all. Mm. You see the schools, how they are built right. and the built by the NJSI. So I think it's a very need uh, mm. for the people to work. Actually, I have one more question, which okay. is why do you think it's important to educate girls? To educate girls. Uh, I've been uh, learn. I studied in convent school, a girls' school. Uh, I was always, I mean, my family and uh, my school brought up is like that, that I, the girls should be educated. Why? If you say why, then the mostly uh, the girls are the ones who stays at home and with the children. So if the women, if the mother is educated, then the child will be educated. So very nice. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much. Great. And so we'll end with the last uh, video, which is only a few seconds, I think, if we have time. Uh, number 11. So it is very important that the poor hear their own voices. And one of the books I read came from your country, it's The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And I found it very revealing. But they are brought up in a South American environment. We belong to the Himalayas. So we created a different type of pedagogy. I mean, I read the book and I thought it was terrific. But you have to make your own book. They choose women. Thank you. So I think that's a great way to end. Maybe we'll just show the last slide of our PowerPoint. Um, so uh, Noreen, who has been around for a long time doing this work, uh, she 
encouraged us, choose women. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought it was really uh, wonderful to hear from Shristi, the administrative director of the Nepal Jesuit Social Institute, and what, why she said how important it is. And so just a slide before for a minute, if you don't mind. Uh, so this is our campaign for the fall, Education, Her Right, Our Future. So you will hear about this more as, uh, as the fall comes. And in the next slide, you will uh, see our keynote speaker. We hope she's going to be able to come to Canada from South Africa if she gets a visa. And so she is working on developing a proposal for a return to school. She's a young woman, uh, still uh, she's a university student. And so we're looking forward to, to receiving her. And so with that, um, in the next slide, I'll just, uh, I think there was one more. Oh yeah. So this is our newsletter, which focused on education. And uh, if you would like a copy, you write to us, there's the email or phone and our website, you will find everything on our website. And with that, I end and with um, a, a, a word of gratitude for all of you for sticking around, uh, but also a big thank you for all the people that whose voices we heard and who welcomed us and who were willing to answer our questions. And they really, truly inspired me. And I hope that they have inspired you as well. Thank you very much, Jenny, for your presentation. Uh, you enlightened us on the need for girls' education globally. And uh, thanks also to CJI for um, doing this work to help young women and, and to help their um, so society and culture in which they live and keeping it uh, to the front of our, our um, attention. It's a serious and meaningful work. Um, but the joy and the hope of the students in your presentation to us uh, just additionally imprints on uh, how important this work is um, because they were not sad, they were not dismayed. They were just full of life and uh, hope for the future. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to walk with them on that journey. Uh, good luck in your fall campaign on girls' education. Thank so um, we only have time for a couple of questions. Um, uh, for um, Jenny. So the first, the first one would be, what is the impact on the, the males in the um, community, in males in the community? Are traditional roles challenged by girls' education? Um. You know, as we know, it's hard to make a huge generalizations um, because we're talking about many cultures, many uh, contexts, very, very different. And so we would have to break that down a bit. But um, I think what the what I heard from Alisa in this most recent trip is that, um, you know, sometimes uh, girls, uh, women who take a very active role, sometimes they're challenged, especially when they, it means that they leave the home and that they get involved in their community organizing and they go to meetings. Uh, sometimes that is seen as a challenge. Um, however, I think we also heard from, even from the girls that we listened to today, how they're families encourage them well at least the ones that were there uh, obviously one could say well that's because they were the girls that made it through through the school there and through the tutoring and there's many others who weren't sent to that but there are uh, you know parents and particularly mothers you know, I think we heard a couple of them say, if a mother is educated, then the girls, their kids, not just the girls, the kids will be educated because the mother will take the, the uh, will push for the kids to be educated. I think there's definitely still, as you heard, a lot of uh, gender discrimination. Uh, boys are favored and uh, the 
there, there is, I know when we were in the, in the slum area, it was the women who took the leadership to make sure they got a clinic, they got the lighting in the neighborhood. And we asked them, where are the men? <laughs> because these are not things that benefit only the women. But um, it was the women who, who do it and who take an active role. And so it does create a bit of tension. However, I think that then see the, how they benefit from that involvement. Thank you. How can we volunteer or support the yeah. education of girls? Well, you know, um, eh, volunteer is is um, is a, a tricky business. You know, there I think. Uh, you know, there are very, very qualified people locally. The issue is that they don't have uh, the, uh, the, the, the resources to be able to, to do uh, what they need to do. It, it is true, we heard uh, over time that uh, they lack uh, qualified teachers. That is one of the big challenges in many of the schools that we visited, uh, including Jesuit schools in uh, in Nepal, and they lack uh, qualified teachers. So, um, you know, but the issue is not that there aren't places where they could get qualified. The issue is that they don't have the money to go to get qualified. So, you know, the best thing to do to help is to 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 help to finance uh, some of them to get teacher education or to support the creation of teacher training centers. But it is also true that if people have specific skills, you know, to do an in-service, if there are people here that have particular skills in, um, in teacher training, I think that would be welcomed, you know, for, for short periods of time. And another, uh, so yeah, I think that was the, the question of how to support as volunteers or in other ways. And, and the other ways, of course, is, is financially, but also to support campaigns, you know, to support uh, greater allocation of funding by governments or by organiz international organizations to education. And our last uh, question starts with uh, a comment about charities and just ends with a with a question. Thank you for the presentation. It's a great cause. I'm originally a woman from a poor developing country and benefited from the value of girls education. My struggle is you you are competing with so many other nonprofits for our donations. It would be helpful if you would provide more data on what percentage of donations goes to administration costs. And please add CGI on Charity Intelligence or Charity Navigator, which rates the charities to give us peace of mind that our money has the right impact. How can we assure that the people in positions of power at these nonprofits do not take advantage of the vulnerability of these girls? Is there an accountability mechanism? Sure. So first of all, I want to say that the point of this presentation wasn't to raise money, yeah. but it was to talk about um, a topic that is important in our solidarity work. So um, I wasn't trying to, I'm not trying to raise money, uh, but encouraging people to, to uh, learn about the issue of education and how important it is for a future of our societies overall. And uh, secondly, uh, our um, our financial statements and the percentage that goes into, um, into administration is available in the CRA website and also in our own website. And, uh, and I would definitely encourage people who are supporting charities to check that out before you donate to charities. And so, um, you know, it is important if, that uh, people, uh, that there be transparency in, in this work and that charities owe it to people who support us to be as transparent as possible. And, um, and then the last issue was around um, how do we ensure that people in position of power do not take advantage of the vulnerability of these girls and women. And so that is a very good point. And, um, and uh, there's been, uh, 
uh, many uh, cases uh, and also you know it, it's, it's made the news of uh, various organizations agencies not only agencies but also uh, uh, multi um, government uh, multilateral organizations where there has been uh, uh, cases of um, abuse uh, and taking advantage, as, as they say, of the vulnerability of girls and women. So I think we have to put that um, at, as of key priorities. I think we, in this kind of work, we have to ensure that we have mechanisms in place for child protection, for uh, protection of uh, children, of vulnerable adults and uh, of women and girls. And so, for example, um, and there's a whole, there are guidelines, there's a whole list of things that should be done and we know what needs to be done. And, uh, and so, and even some of the things that I mentioned today about having uh, washrooms that are gender um, uh, sensitive in the sense that uh, you need a lock in, uh, in in the uh, uh, washrooms and you need lighting you need uh, uh, people need to feel safe and uh, currently if you go to i've traveled a lot and in many places you do not find that and very very basic things like that is our responsibility as nonprofit organizations that we should not be supporting anything that does not um meet those minimum standards or at least work with our partners to ensure that those minimum standards are met. Thank you, Jenny. That comes to uh, the end of our evening. I'd like to ask uh, all the participants to join us back in September when Father Scott Lewis will open up the fall season uh, in, for our webinars. And uh, thanks to Jose Sanchez, to uh, Fanny and our translators, uh, Michelle and Albert, for their behind the scenes contribution to the webinar, and to the CGI staff, especially Peter uh, Nimer and Clara Atala, who um, help behind the scenes also. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. Have a wonderful summer and good night. Thank you. Just one, oh, just one reminder. Yeah, just one reminder for everyone, the recording of the session will be sent by 72 hours. Uh, people always ask, so please. And also don't forget to fill out the brief poll that will pop on your screen right after the session. It really helps that we uh, to improve future sessions. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.